It's time for another episode in the Sherlock Holmes series. And this one's called The Illustrious Client. There's only one thing more pleasant than the Turkish bath itself, Watson. Yeah? And what's that, Holmes? The pleasant lassitude of the drawing room. I never knew tobacco tastes pleasanter anywhere. Mm. Can't say it makes that shag of yours smell any better. Still, you're right about the drawing room, Holmes. It does something for you. For me? Yes. Gets rid of some of your confounded reticence. Makes you... Well, I was going to say, makes you more human. <laughs> Does it indeed? What I suppose you really mean, Watson, is that you find it loosens my tongue and helps to satisfy that insatiable curiosity of yours, eh? <laughs> Well, I had thought of asking you whether you had anything of interest on hand at the moment. And now you have asked. I think you will find your answer in those papers sticking out of my jacket pocket there. Uh, where? These? Yes. To be more precise, it's a letter. You may read it, if you wish. Oh, thank you. Addressed from the Carlton Club yesterday evening. Yes. Sir James Damery presents his compliments to Mr. Sherlock Holmes and will call upon him at 4.30 tomorrow. Sir James begs to say that the matter upon which he desires to consult Mr. Holmes is very delicate and also very important. He trusts, therefore, that Mr. Holmes will make every effort to grant this interview. Hmm. Pretty formal, eh, Holmes? How do you know of this man, Damery? Only that his name's a household word in society. I can tell you a little more than that. He has rather a reputation for arranging delicate matters which are to be kept out of the papers. You may remember his negotiations with Sir George Lewis over the Hammerford Will case. Yes, yes, I do. He's a man of the world with a natural turn for diplomacy. I'm bound to hope, therefore, that this is not a false scent. He must have some real need of our assistance. Our assistance, Holmes? Well, if you'll be so good. <laughs> I should be honored. Then you have the hour. 4.30. Until then, we can put the matter out of our heads. Come in. Come in, Sir James. Welcome to my humble abode. Delighted, Mr. Holmes. Ah, and this, no doubt, is Dr. Watson. <laughs> yes. How do you do, sir? I was prepared to find you here, Doctor. Mr. Holmes may find your collaboration very necessary, I fancy. Indeed. Uh, pray take the basket chair. Thank you. Mother. Mr. Holmes, have you ever heard of Baron Gruner? The Austrian murderer. Oh, 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 there's no getting past you at all, Mr. Holmes. So, you've sized him up as a murderer already. It is my business to follow the details of continental crime. Who could possibly have read what happened in Prague and have any doubts about the man's guilt? It was a purely technical legal point in the death of a witness that saved him. I'm as sure he killed his wife when that so-called accident happened in the Splugen Pass, as if I'd seen him do it. And many people would agree with you. I also know that he has come to England. In fact, I had a presentiment that sooner or later he would find some work for me to do. Well, what's he been up to? Not the old tragedy again? No, more serious than that. To revenge crime is important, but to prevent it is more so. Agreed. It's a terrible thing, Mr. Holmes, to see a dreadful event, a an atrocious situation, preparing itself before your eyes, and yet be utterly unable to avert it. Uh, you all agree, Watson? Can a human being be placed in a more trying position? I hardly think so. And then you all both sympathize with the client in whose interests I'm acting. Oh. I didn't understand that you were merely an intermediary. Who is the principal, then? Hey, Mr. Holmes, I must beg you not to press that question. It is important that I should be able to assure him that his honored name has in no way been dragged into the matter. His motives are honorable and chivalrous to the last degree, and he prefers to remain unknown. I'm sorry, Sir James. I'm accustomed to mystery at one end of my cases. But to have them at both ends is too confusing. I fear I must decline to act. You place me in a most serious dilemma. I'm perfectly certain that you would be proud to take over the case if I could give you that one fact. And yet I, a promise forbids me to reveal it. Well, then, I'm afraid... Uh, Mr. Holmes, may I at least lay all that I can before you? 
So long as it is understood that I commit myself to nothing? That is understood. In the first place, then, you've no doubt heard of General de Merville. De Merville of the Kyber Park? The same. Yes, I've heard of him. He has a daughter, Violet. She's young, beautiful, accomplished, and very rich. It is this daughter, Mr. Holmes, who we must save from the clutches of a fiend. Baron Gruner has a hold over her. The strongest of all holds where a woman is concerned, love. As you may have heard, the fellow's extraordinarily handsome, with a most fascinating manner, and all that air of romance and mystery. Uh, you know what I mean. The sort of thing that means so much to a woman. They say there isn't one of them can resist him. How did he come to meet the lady of Mr. Merville's standing? It was on a Mediterranean yachting cruise. The villain attached himself to her and won her heart, just like that. She absolutely dotes on him. She's obsessed by him, in fact. Outside of him, there's nothing on earth for her. She won't hear a word against him. Everything's been done to cure her of it. And so? In short... She proposes to marry him next month. I see. She has a will of iron when she's of age. It's so hard to know what to do to prevent her. Does she know about his past? Uh, the Austrian episode? The cunning devil's told her every bit of scandal he's had a part in. And he's done it in such a way that he always turns out to be the innocent martyr. Now she simply accepts his version of everything and listens to no other. Very difficult indeed. But surely, Sir James, in telling us all this, you've inadvertently let out the name of your client. General de Merville. Well, Mr. Holmes, I could deceive you, perhaps, by letting you think that, but it wouldn't be true. De Merville is a broken old man. His daughter is set on marrying a scheming adventurer. He could cut her off, no doubt, but the money isn't the whole of it. It's her future happiness. Yes, quite, quite. Dr. Watson... The nerve that never failed him on the battlefield is gone, quite gone. The old man's utterly incapable of dealing with a brilliant rascal like this Austrian. Your client, then? All I dare say, Mr. Holmes, is that he's an old friend who's known the general intimately for years. He's taken a paternal interest in this young girl since she wore short frocks. And he can't see this tragedy acted out without some attempt to stop it. I can go no further than that. Sir James, your problem interests me. I shall be happy to look into it. Then I'm most deeply obliged to you. I felt sure that once you'd heard the facts. Now, I mustn't detain you any longer. How shall I keep in touch with you? My club will find me. And the Baron's present address, please? Oh, of course. Vernon Lodge near Kingston. It's a large place. He's been fortunate in some rather shady speculations. He's a rich man now, which I fancy makes him more dangerous as an antagonist than ever. Apart from what you've told me, can you give me anything further about him? Well, expensive taste, you know. Horse fancier, collects books and pictures. Quite an artistic side to him. I believe he's an authority on Chinese pottery. He wrote a book about it. All great criminals have a complex mind. My old friend Charlie Peace was a violin virtuoso. Wainwright was no mean artist. I could quote you many more. Well, Sir James, you may inform your illustrious client that I am turning my mind upon Baron Gruner. Uh, then um, I'll say good day to you, gentlemen. Good day. Good day, Sir James. And don't forget my club any time. Very well. Well, Watson... Any views? I suppose you'll see the young lady herself. <laughs> My dear Watson, if her poor old broken father can't move her, what can a stranger expect to do? No, I think we must begin from a different angle. Perhaps Shinwell Johnson could help. Shinwell Johnson, that ruffian? Ah, Watson, repentance is a noble thing. Two terms in Parkhurst have worked wonders in Master Johnson. Uh... But how can he help you? He has the entree of every nightclub, doss house, and gambling den in the city. This ruffian of yours. His two convictions have invested him with a certain glamour. He also has a quick eye and an active brain, which, I am happy to say, have been placed at the disposal of the forces of law and order on more than one occasion. Ah, a knock, then? Not ready. 
If he'd acted for the police, he'd have been found out by now. Fortunately, however, he confines his attention to cases which never come directly into the courts. I tell you what, Watson. We'll meet for dinner this evening at our place in the Strand, eh? Meanwhile, I'll have a word or two with Master Shinwell Johnson. Capital soup. Never varies, thank heaven. Never mind the soup, Holmes. You have a particularly nasty delight in keeping me waiting for your news. <laughs> Have I? Well, there's nothing much to tell. Johnson is on the prowl for us. He may pick up some useful garbage in the darker recesses of the underworld. But surely if the lady won't accept what's already known about Baron Gruner, why should anything we can find out change her mind for her? Who knows? Woman's heart and mind are insoluble puzzles to the male. Murder might be condoned or explained, and yet some smaller offense may rankle. Baron Gruner remarked to me... Gruner remarked to you? Oh, to be sure. You know how I love to come to grips with my man. I like to meet him eye to eye and read for myself what stuff he's made of. When I'd given Johnson his orders, I took a cab out to Kingston... I found the Baron in an affable mood. Did he recognize you? There was no difficulty about that. I sent him my card. He received me at once. I rather thought I should see you sooner or later. Uh, you have been engaged, no doubt, by General de Melville to try to stop my marriage with his daughter, Violet. <laughs> Is it not so? As you wish. My dear man, uh, let me tell you at once... You will only ruin your well-deserved reputation, uh, to say nothing of incurring some danger. Let me strongly advise you to draw off at once. Curiously enough, that was the very advice I had intended giving you. So? I have a respect for your brains, Baron. And the little I've seen of your personality has not lessened it. But let me put it to you as man to man. Very well. No one wants to rake up your past. It is over, and you are now in smooth waters. But if you persist in this adventurous marriage, you will raise up a swarm of powerful enemies who will never leave you alone until they have made England too hot to hold you. I ask you, is the game worth it? <laughs> oh, oh, dear. Excuse my amusement, Mr. Holmes. But it really is funny to see you trying to play a hand with no cards in it at all. I don't think anyone could do better. But it's rather pathetic all the same. Not a color card there, Mr. Holmes. Nothing but the smallest of the small. If you choose to think so. I know. Now, uh, let me make this thing clear to you. For my own hand is so strong that I can afford to show it. I have been fortunate enough to win the entire affection of this lady... This has been given to me in spite of the fact that I told her clearly of all the unhappy incidents in my past life. I also told her that certain wicked and designing persons, I hope you recognize yourself, uh, would come to her and tell her these things, and I warned her how to treat them. Then there is nothing more to be said. If you will excuse me, I will wish you good day, Baron Gunnar. Certainly. The pleasure has been all mine. Uh, before you go, though, Mr. Holmes... Well? Did you know Le Brun, the French agent? Yes. I knew him. Do you know what happened to him? I heard he was beaten by some Apache in Montmartre and crippled for night. Quite true. By a curious coincidence, though, he had been inquiring into my affairs only a week before. Don't do it, Mr. Holmes. It is not a lucky thing. So there you are, Watson. You are up to date at last. The fellow seems dangerous enough. Mighty dangerous. I disregard the blusterer. But this is the sort of man who says rather less than he means. Must you interfere? I mean to say, does it matter so much if he does marry the girl? They are free to choose, after all. Considering that he undoubtedly murdered his last wife, I should say it mattered very much. Our illustrious client evidently thinks so, too. But come along, drink up your coffee and come home with me. 
Our friend Shinwell will be waiting for us there. Uh, gentlemen, allow me to introduce Miss Kitty Winter, who I took the liberty of bringing along of me. What she don't know, <laughs> but she can speak for herself. Yes. We're old mates, Shinwell and me, mister. Same address, almost, huh? Hell, London. That's it. Finds us every time. But there's a chap who ought to be down in a lower hell than us. If there's any justice in the world, I'll tell you. I gather we have your good wishes in our little investigation, Miss Winter. Oh, I'll say so. If I can't help put Adelbert Gruner where he belongs, I'm yours to the rattle. You know him, then? My past's neither here nor there. But what I am, Gruner made me. Straight he did. Has Shinwell told you how the matter stands? I have, sir. I left nothing out. The lady is madly in love with him, Miss Winter. She's been told everything about him, but she cares nothing. Told about the murder? Yes. She must have a nerve. She puts it all down as lies. Can't you show her proof? What proofs? What? Well, ain't I a proof myself? If I went and told her how he used me... Would you do that? Would I? There's one or two more murders than the one that made such a fuss. I know a few things. And there's that book of his. A book? I tell you, mister, that man collects women like anyone collects butterflies or moths. And they're all in that book. All the details. Names, snapshots, things you wouldn't believe any man could write down. That'd show her a thing or two, and I know where he keeps it. Uh, how can you know that now? Well, least ways I, I know where he always did keep it. Special place he had, in a big cabinet thing, where he keeps a lot of his Chinese crockery. Very interesting, Miss Winter. Very interesting indeed. I think I shall take advantage of your offer to confront the lady in question with what you know. As for the book, I think we'll keep that to ourselves for the time being. Then, if all else fails... Uh, Watson, tomorrow morning, Miss Winter and I will pay our call on Mr. Melville. Be good enough to meet me for lunch afterwards, and I'll post you up. Our place in the Strand will do again, I think. Murder is a tech on famous detective. Paper! Sherlock Holmes attacked in Regent Street. Paper! Here, my boy. Here you are, Governor. Oh, shilling, sir. Oh, all right, all right. Keep the change. So very much, Governor. Paper! Paper! Murder is a tech on famous detective. Good heavens. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, a well-known detective. Victim, murderous assault. Attacked about 12 o'clock, Regent Street. Two men armed with sticks, beaten about the head. Injuries. Doctors described as serious, taken to Charing Cross Hospital. Afterwards insisted, taken to his own room. Help! Cabin! Cabin! As quick as you can, man. 221B Baker Street. Go for your life! It isn't old Watson. Uh, you've been with him, Sir Leslie. How is he? Oh, no immediate danger, you know. A mm, couple of lacerated scalp wounds. Good deal of bruising. Oh, uh, can I see him? Oh, I wouldn't do any harm for a few minutes. It's a tough sort of character, you know. You don't stay too long. I must be dashing. Must look me up sometime. Uh, yes, yes, certainly. All right, Watson, my dear fellow... Don't look so scared. It's not as bad as it seems. Thank heaven for that. I'm not so bad at single stick myself. Took most of them on my guard. Uh, it was the second fellow who was too much for me. The papers say they got away. They were well prepared. The police? Uh, no, wait a little. Oh, hmm. uh, I have my plans. First thing is to exaggerate my injuries. Who, who do? Everyone. 
They'll come to you for news. Laid on thick. Uh, lucky if I live the week out. Uh, concussion, delirium. You can't overdo it. And Sir Leslie Oakshot? I'll look after him. He'll see the worst side of me. Hmm. Anything else? Tell Shinwell Johnson to get that girl, Kitty Winter, out of the way. If they dare to do me in, it's not likely they'll neglect her. <clears throat> That's urgent, Watson. Right. I'll go now. Right. Oh, and put out my pipe on the table, will you? And the tobacco. Uh, come in each morning and we'll plan our campaign. Well, Holmes, you are looking better. Sir so Leslie took out my stitches today. Just seven days to recover. Not bad, eh? Tonight's papers say you've developed erysipelas. Capital, <laughs> my dear fellow. I shall enjoy having that very much. Uh, no, seriously, though, Holmes. I have some news you won't find so amusing. What? Baron Gruner sails from Liverpool on Friday. Say so? To the States. Important business to settle before his impending marriage, etc., etc. Righty. Only three more days. Yes. Mark my words, he wants to put himself out of harm's way until the last moment. But he won't, Watson. By the Lord Harry, he won't. Now listen. Yes? I want you to do something for me. I'm here to be used. Well then, spend the next 24 hours studying Chinese pottery. Studying Chinese pottery? An intensive study. Your friend Lomax at the London Library shall be just the man to help. Now, no questions. Off you go to your crammer. I'll see you here tomorrow evening. Well, Holmes, I shall never be able to believe newspapers again after this. They say you're dying. Well done, Watson. <laughs> now, as you see, I'm on my legs again and feeling none the worse. And now, Watson, have you learned your lessons? Well, as best I can. It's a big subject. Chinese ceramics in 24 hours, granted. The point is, could you keep up an intelligent conversation on the subject? Oh, I think so. Uh, for a while, anyway. And pray hand me that little box from the mantelpiece. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Now, take a look at this. I say. This is the real eggshell pottery of the Ming Dynasty. No finer piece ever passed through the sale rooms. A complete set would be worth a king's ransom. In fact, I doubt if there's one in existence outside the Imperial Palace in Peking. Exquisite. The sight of this would drive a real connoisseur wild. You'll have to handle it carefully. I shall. I should say Dr. Hill Barton of 369 Half Moon Street must handle it carefully. What? That's your name for this evening, Watson. Here's a visiting card I've had prepared for you. And what is Dr. Hill Barton to do? At half past eight, you will call upon Baron Gruner. An appointment has been made saying you're bringing with you a specimen of an absolutely unique set of Ming. You may as well be a medical man. It will make your part easier to play. You're a collector. This piece has come your way. You've heard of the Baron's interest in the subject. And you're not averse to selling at a price. At what price? Well, asked Watson. You would certainly fall down badly if you didn't know the value of your own wares. Actually, this saucer was got for me by Sir James Damery. You will not be exaggerating if you suggest it could hardly be matched in the world today. Uh, then I could suggest that the set be valued by an expert. Excellent. Yes. You know, you're positively scintillating today. <laughs> Thank you. Your delicacy prevents you putting a price on it yourself. What could be more natural? Oh... Uh... What if he won't see me, after all? Oh, yes, he will. No more instructions, my dear chap. We will let the interview take care of itself. Pray sit down, Dr. Barton. I was just looking over my own treasures and wondering whether I could really afford to add to them. Uh, this little tang specimen from the 7th century will interest you, I'm sure. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Did you ever see finer workmanship or, or a better glaze, huh? But uh, have you the Ming saucer with you? Here it is, Baron Gruner. Uh, what do you think of that? 
Very fine, very fine indeed. And you say you have a set of six to correspond? Uh, that is so. What puzzles me is that I should not have heard of such magnificent specimens. I only know of one in England to match this, and it's certainly not likely to be on the market. Would it be uh, indiscreet, Doctor, to ask how you obtained this? <laughs> Does it really matter? <laughs> you can see it's genuine for yourself. As to the value, I'm content to take an expert's valuation. Well, that's the piece is genuinely certain. And yet, in dealing with objects of such value, one naturally wishes to know all about the transaction. But suppose... I'm bound to take every possibility into account. Suppose it should prove afterwards that you have no right to sell. I would guarantee you against any claims of the sort. That, of course, would open up the question as to what your guarantee was worth. My bankers would answer that. Uh, quite so. And yet, the whole transaction strikes me as rather unusual. Well, Baron, I should hate to waste your valuable time. <clears throat> I've, uh, I've given you first offer, as I understood you were a connoisseur, but I shall have no difficulty in other quarters. Uh, no, pray be seated again, sir. Uh, oh, very well. May I ask, Doctor... Who told you I was a connoisseur? <laughs> you have written a book on the subject. Have you read the book? Uh, no. Dear me, this becomes more and more difficult to understand. You too are a connoisseur and collector with a piece as valuable as this in your hands, and yet you have never troubled to consult the one book which would have told you its value. I'm a very busy man. I'm a doctor in practice. If a man has a hobby, he follows it up whatever his other pursuits may be. Well, as a connoisseur, you'd have no objection if I asked a few questions to test you, huh? I would ask you, what do you know of the Emperor Shomu? And how do you associate him with the Shoso in Yanara? Tell me a little about the North Wei dynasty and its place in the history of ceramics. Oh, really, sir, this is intolerable. I came here to do you a favor and not be examined like a schoolboy, my knowledge may be inferior to yours, but I shall certainly not answer questions put in so offensive a way. No, Dr. Barton, if you are a doctor at all, you are here on another game. You're an emissary of Sherlock Holmes, aren't you? The fellow's dying, so he sends his hirelings to keep watch on me. Isn't that it? Well, you've made your way in here. And by heaven, you may find it harder to get out again. All right, Watson. Leave it to me oh, now. What's this? Be careful, Holmes. He's getting a gun. Out of my way, everyone. It's my uh, turn uh, now. Miss Winter. Keep back. Oh, no. This won't take a second. Here, Baron Adelbert Ritter. <laughs> that face won't charm any more like me again. <laughs> it's not all over his face. Quick, Holmes, for the love of heaven. Find me some kind of oil. We may save his eyes if we're quick enough, but hurry, hurry! Oh, horrible, Holmes. Horrible. The wages of sin, Watson. The wages of sin. And believe me, there was plenty of sin to answer for. Yes, but not like that. I assure you, Watson, I had no idea she had vitriol with her. She came with me to find that book she told us about. Our time was limited by your knowledge of Chinese ceramics. It was our only chance. He takes precautions against burglary at night. And he'd never have left the book behind when he went off to the States. It was our last chance. You understand, Sir James? Of course, of course. The man was a murderer, Watson, and could have been again. Yes, well, I suppose so. Anyway, he's disfigured for life now. A uh, miss. Mr. Merville is out of danger. So it seems. Not yet, I'm afraid. Women of her type don't react like that. She'd probably love him all the more as a disfigured martyr. No, Sir James. Take this filthy book to your client and tell him not to spare her feelings with it. It's his moral side that must be destroyed, not the physical. The book will bring her down to earth like nothing else could. It's in his own handwriting. She can't get past that. Very well. It's been a terrible business, but you've done wonders, both of you. Good day. Good day, Good day Sir, James. Sir James. 
My police will have a good deal to say to Miss Kitty Winter, I fear, Watson. Though in her case, there are certainly extenuating circumstances. I expect you're right. But to think that any woman... Ah, me, I fear you have something to learn yet. If I were to tell Holmes, you... Holmes, quickly, come to the window. Why? What is it? Sir James Damery. That brougham he just got into. See it? There, moving off now. The coat of arms on the side. Aha! Uh-huh. Now I know who our illustrious client was. He's... He's a chivalrous gentleman and a loyal friend to a lady in great danger. Let that be enough for us, my dear Watson. Now and forever. In The Illustrious Client, you heard Robert Langford and Kenneth Baker as Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Others in the cast were Fiona Fraser, Gabriel Bayman, John Hayter, Bruce Anderson, and Louis Ive.